In Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, we're going to once again enter into the end, or really the beginning. The curtains will part and we will see into eternity. And so take out your Bibles, uh, your phones. If you're bringing out your phone, I know that you're not playing Candy Crush. You are, you are looking at version or BibleGateway.com or something, but you're reading the Word of God. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His throne in His heavenly glory. This is, in a sense, prophecy. It is the telling of what will be. And the reason why we are given prophecy is knowing what will be, we know how to live now. All the nations will be gathered before Him. He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. When I was in college, I needed a second job, and so I, uh, I began driving a school bus in rural Arkansas. And um, the, the way this thing worked was, was led down to the buses. Uh, they didn't say a word to me. Um, this grumpy old man uh, led me to these buses that were parked this far across. He led me to the most uh, ancient of buses and just sat down behind me without saying a word. The thing was so worn, the shift knob was so worn that there was not even any gear patterns on it anymore. And he just sat there. And I'm, am I supposed to go? He just looked at me like, you're here, aren't you? And then I had to take a test. And they gave me a couple of pages to study. And I took the test and I came back and they said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I, I took my test and I passed. They said, you made a 100. I said, well, that's great. They said, no, it's not because we gave you the test. We have the test from the state troopers. You're not supposed to make a 100. They're going to know we have the test. I said, well, you didn't tell me that you gave me the test. I, I didn't know to do bad. You know, if you'd have told me, I would have missed a few. And I, I, actually, I wouldn't have taken that. But guys, I want to share with you that we've got the test right here. It's been given to us, okay? So you know what's going to happen. Every one of us here is being told what's going to happen. All the answers to our lives are being given right here and right now. There's coming a day when the Son of Man, this Jesus, who right now is often disrespected and ignored, no, 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 this Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is what life is all about, has always been all about. And no matter how blind we were on earth and how much we ignored Him, He is the reason for it all. And He is coming again. And, and one day we'll gather all of us. We're going to be there in glory. And He's going to be on His throne and we're going to see it. And then He's going to be separating people Right and left, sheep from goats. The king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father and take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. As we live on planet earth, you know, wanting to get more for ourselves, you need to live in light of the reality that this earth, earth is not your home and you're not here to get what you can. You have a kingdom being prepared for you, you have an inheritance that has been uh, being built for you since the foundation of the world. That's what you're living for. And he says, take your inheritance, this kingdom prepared for this reason, verse 35. For I was hungry and you gave me something to drink. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. That's how personal it is. I was, I was hungry, not somebody else, but I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when, I, I don't remember that. When did we ever see you hungry and feed you, you thirsty and give you a drink, you a stranger and invite you in, you needing clothes and clothing, clothing you, you sick and in prison and we came to visit you. And Matthew 25, 40 says this, a, a verse every one of us needs to memorize. The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, 
you did for me. Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, and you go into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you kept me out. You didn't invite me in. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. I needed clothes. You didn't clothe me. And the people are going to say, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick and in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And then they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And so this radical Jewish carpenter is making this connection between the divine and what appears to be mundane, the eternal and the temporal, between his own infinite self and all the finite beings that live on earth. And he's saying they're connected in ways you don't realize. And he's saying he's in the world and, and in the people that we would call the least. He's there. And the people that we would shut outside, see as different, um, say they're a different tribe, the people that we would rather not look at, rather not sit by because they smell, rather not be a part of their broken, those people have, have this connection to Jesus. In fact, those people Jesus said are him. And so where we are in this modern 21st century thing called church that looks so different than the first century is with a, 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 you know, a nation of people calling themselves Christians who, who are learning stuff in their heads but never meeting Jesus out in the broken. Who are, who are able to live in the world and, and able also to not see those who are hungry thirsty, those who need help, clothing, those who are hurting. We're able to claim to see Jesus but not see them. And we want to touch Jesus and, and many of us honestly are dissatisfied with the authenticity of our faith because like, you know, is there really a God? Is, is this all real? And, and it just seems like after a while so distant and so, but the reason why Jesus seems so distant is because we're staying far from him because we don't meet him just in the expected places like here. We meet Jesus in the unexpected places and in the unexpected people. That we, that we walk towards not as superiors or benefactors, but we walk towards as brothers and sisters, as Jesus. It's easy to ignore the broken. It's easy to kind of build safe zones that we stay in and, and just say we don't go outside of those. Um, Wednesday morning, we were going to fly to Willow Creek, uh, and, um, and Tuesday night, I was, you know, my packing style, I don't know about some of you, but, um, you know, like 15 to 20 minutes is it, you know, <laughs> and the least I can carry, the better, you know, if, if I could, if I could fit a week's survival gear in a matchbox, that would be like, awesome, you know, um, and so, you know, um, I, it's 11.30, I, I'm going to go to bed, and then I'll, I'll get up in the morning and, and pack 20 minutes before I leave. Um, but I've got everything prepared. It's okay. And the phone rings. And it is a young man, um, a rookie Baltimore uh, police officer who's part of our fellowship. And uh, he called me, and he just said, um, my... My girlfriend's father has just been shot and killed. And I was the first one on the scene. And what are the chances of that in a city as big as Baltimore? That a young rookie cop would be called to a shooting and find family there. And so I drove out to the crime scene and 
and stayed there with him and eight of his fellow Baltimore police officers who had nothing to do with the investigation, they weren't there, but eight, eight people just from all over Baltimore drove there just to be with him. And I thought that spoke really well. And the shock and the, the agony of, of seeing this murder victim, no longer a name or statistic, but a relative. I, I had spoken with Derek. I, I talked to him about his job. I talked to him about where he worked and his desire to work someplace else. And, and, and I have met him and known him and was deeply impressed by him. 210 murders in Baltimore so far. They've only officially publishing the statistics, I guess, from the 5th of August. Um, 398 non-fatal shootings. It's not for lack of trying, right? Um, 580 total shootings in terms of all of this. And, and it's easy to look the other way. It's easy to pretend that's out there, that's not us. Well, the reality is that broken is everywhere. That, that this county we live in, this suburbia of garages and green lawns is the fourth highest in the nation in the opioid epidemic. Fourth highest county in the nation. Uh, that's us. That's the people around us. That's the broken in the burbs that we also don't like to look at. And so what do we do with the broken? Most of us want to build a safe haven and stay as far away from it as we can. Most of us uh, want to look the other way. Most of us, honestly, honestly, we live our lives in the story of the Good Samaritan less like the Good Samaritan than like the Pharisee who stepped over and around, kept his zone of safety, and walked his own way. Chaplain Denise, she was there that night. She was there all night. She didn't drive, but she would get people to take her to the crime scenes, and she would stay. And she would minister, and she would love. She was still there when I left at 5.30 or 6 in the morning. She lost her son, shot by three young men in 2006. He didn't die till 2009 of his paralysis. And what did she do with her broken and her pain? She visits every mother of a murdered child. She shows up in the middle of the night and she weeps with the wife who has to call and say, I don't know how to tell you this, but your father was murdered. I don't know how to tell you this, but your son has died. Now, to tell you the truth, if the man behind the trigger could have been with us there that night and heard the wailing and the weeping over the phone again and again and again as we called each successive family member, would they have done what they've done? Well, Pastor Drew, there's nothing we could do about that. We have no gospel. Oh, I see there's some people who can't be saved. I didn't realize that. I, I, I didn't realize that we, we were not permitted uh, by statute to cross county lines or street uh, lines or, or color lines or any lines. I, I, I did not realize that we were prevented from going and telling people that God loves them, that they are of infinite worth. You see, if that young man had been saved, everything would have changed. I was helping a friend move in um, Howard County. He'd been fired from his job and, and I, everybody else kind of abandoned him and I showed up to help him move, um, as did another man to, to move him from a moving company. He had on a, um, you know, it was hot, and he had on a, a very loose sleeveless T-shirt 
and uh, his man in about his mid 40s um, looked like he'd done some hard living. He had uh, some sort of a pump pack on and and um, you know intravenous thing, and he's moving. So he's obviously got medical conditions, but he's moving, and he also had several round uh, wounds on his shoulders, which I've been around enough to know they were bullet holes. 30 minutes later, my friend led him to Jesus. And the joy on his face as he accepted Christ and believed that God was putting and could put his life back together, that he could be there and was being there for his son, was astonishing. When the Son of Man comes, he's going to separate out the people who were religious. Some will be goats, and the goats didn't go. The sheep, they heard his voice, and they followed him into the broken. And guys, I want to tell you that it's time for the Church of the Living God st to stop playing defense and get on the offense and to believe our own gospel and to live with a courage and a confidence that is, that, that is warranted by the success and the win of Jesus. Can I remind you, we win? So if we win in the fourth quarter, why are we, why are we looking so hangdog in the first? Why are, we, why are we walking around like we can't make a difference, like evil is so big and it's so bad that, that we, we've got nothing? We have the victor. We have the name of Jesus to take into the world. And our courage or our cowardice matters forever. In the list in Revelation 20, uh, you know, 20 through 22 of those who don't get into heaven, it's not the murderers who come first. It's not the sexually immoral or the vile. The, the word that Jesus lists first for those who don't get in is the cowardly. So how is your courage quotient in your life? Is your courage quotient very low right now facing what you have to face, whether in your marriage or with your health or your finances? Or, or are you allowing Jesus to pour into you so that your courage, in spite of your circumstance, it's increasing and overflowing? See, you and I have a choice to make whether we're going to be sheep or goats. The sheep let Jesus, what the sheep are, they, they are people who, who let Jesus be you in the broken. They, they are the people who, who actually went and fed not the poor, but Jesus, because Jesus identified himself with them. They are him. And in this strange kind of a story, the truth is they are him and so are we. We are his hands and we are his feet. We are his voice. We are, we are his love in the broken world. I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, verse 40, you did for me. Verse 45, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of these brothers of mine, you did not do for me. It's very, very personal. You see, lost people have their lives full with their own life and pain and busyness and schedule and, and, um, and their own wants and wishes. Lost people, uh, you know, all of life is this, this churn about what's going on with them, but saved people have their life full of Jesus. And as complicated as life is, the paradox is it gets very simple because the issue in life is not the issue you think it is. It's just Jesus. And in the heart of now, you need to imagine the next that's coming, this kingdom, this inheritance that God has prepared for you. So what does it really mean to give your life, your whole life to Christ? I mean, what does that really look like? I mean, beyond religion, beyond churchianity, beyond it all, what does it really look like? What does it mean to, to give and find your whole purpose for living in Jesus? 
What does, it, what does it mean to find your passion in him? Have you found your passion? Is there passion in your life? Or is, is your experience of life kind of this soul-sucking, you know, drain? That's not what you were destined for. That's not the story Jesus wrote when he created you. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the author of your, your faith. He's the one, if you'll give him permission, who will write you a grander story and invite you into a greater vision. And if you're here today and you're living without passion, or your passion is for stupid stuff, your passion is for a broken sexuality that is using people and breaking your family, that's no passion at all. That's, that's hell's cancerous imitation of life. Guys, in the name of Jesus, you were created for something more than this. You were created for, for something more than scratching around on earth and trying to build your own reputation and secure your own popularity and, and your own prestige and advancement at work or in rank. You were created to be Jesus in the world. And the simple truth is that, that we, don't, um, we don't accomplish this by, uh, you know, by, we don't accomplish this this way by, you know, like, on a scale of like one to ten, um, you know, you know, I'm going to try hard to be like Jesus. Okay, now I'm going to try even harder to be like Jesus. Now I'm going to try even harder and harder, and and right now it's really really hard to try to be like Jesus. And somebody invites you to go do something. Oh, I want to do that, but I can't. I got to be like Jesus. That's, that's not how this thing works. Because it, it's not about us uh, trying uh, to be like Jesus. It, it's about, about letting Jesus be us. And, and so, so, so that's, that's the whole deal, is, is that we, we give our life away. And in the giving, there is a filling and a being. And, and Jesus himself, Jesus becomes us. Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27 says. It says that we have the mind of Christ. Um, think about that, the mind of Christ. What does the mind do with the body? Guides it, tells it what to do. Imagine having a body that's disconnected from the mind. That's not a pretty picture. And when we are truly followers of Jesus, Jesus comes to inhabit us, live inside of us. All of life is God-given. All of life is Christ-led. Even our mind is replaced. We have the mind of Christ, and, and Christ in us is the hope of the glory of God. You see, it's not so much a matter of us trying to be Jesus, but simply of letting Jesus be himself in us. And this is wonderfully transforming in, in, in home. For instance, in your marriage, you may be in a marriage where, like, your partner may not be giving equally to you. Let me just say as an aside, rarely ever does that work where people are, like, mutually just giving equally to everything. It just doesn't work like that. Marsh and I joke that in our 37 years, we've had 30 good years of marriage. And, and in our growth and in our, you know, it's like one person's here. You know, I imagine, you know, marriage would be like this. Boom, 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 boom. You know, happy, 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 happy. The way it's worked more is like one of us is here and the other of us is here and then we, we come up and then one of us is here and the other one's here and then, and then sometimes it's really, really close and then somebody and then... But giving your life to Christ means that you're no longer living like a lost person who's full of his own wants and wishes. You're now full of the Holy Spirit of God. And, and what believing means for you is that you let Jesus be Jesus in you. And what Matthew 25, 40 means is that, that to be his means we, we let ourselves be given to Jesus and and you simply let Jesus be you in the broken. If Jesus has your life, he will be your life. 
And, and when we give Jesus access to our lives, we, well, when we give Jesus access to our lives, we are going to the broken, according to Matthew uh, 25. And when we do not go towards the broken, it's because we haven't given Jesus access to our lives. See, so we've set up all these false measures of what it means to give our lives to Jesus. It's church attendance, um, it's how much we know, it's this or that, but, but the, the biblical measure of giving your life to Jesus um, is that you let Jesus be himself in you at home, you let Jesus be himself in you at work, and, and, and you don't just stay on your path you let Jesus be you as you go into the broken because that's what Jesus always did. You're going to find Jesus in the broken. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to do. Jesus is in the broken. He's not in the safety. He's not in the control. He's, he's not in your fulfillment of the American dream. If we do nothing about injustice and human need, if we act like nothing can be done in the name of Jesus about the suffering and the evil in the world around us, we reveal that we never had Jesus in our lives. We, we, never, we never gave him control because when you give Jesus control of your life, he's going. <laughs> he's going to find some hurting person and he's going to be there. If you give Jesus control of your life, you're no longer just going to be living in the whirlwind of your own stuff, you know, because from the moment you're born, crying to the moment you're dying, sometimes crying, there's this whirlwind of, ah! But in Jesus, there's this eternal passion and peace and purpose that, that translates into this redemptive love. I was at the Transformation Center, um, and I was just going to do a quick drive-by and say hi and drop off some stuff, but they were really, you know, slammed with hungry people and, and hurting people, and, and so I stuck around, and, and then I had plans for the afternoon, but it was really late, so I stuck around longer, and, and I was finally getting ready to leave, like around, I don't know, 1, one thirty, you know, and I had planned on leaving, like, far earlier, because my plans, and... And like everybody else has left, and I'm just about to get out, and this man walks in, and he's drunk. Why? Well, you know, I have my own issues. Uh, my father's an alcoholic, and I've never had a lot of success speaking, you know, Jesus to somebody who's actively drunk. It's like the next day they rarely remember the conversation. <laughs> so, so I'm excusing myself from loving this man, right? Oh, and also he smells. And also, he's crying so much that his nose is running, and he's taking his hat off and wiping his nose and putting it back on. And then, and then he wants to hug me. And, and then, honestly, he takes his hat, you know, that he's done this multiple times, and he holds it up against my chest, and I'm going, really, you know? <laughs> and, and, and I'm there, and I'm honestly, it's not like I don't love this guy. I'm thinking in my head, you know, I hope I can catch him again when he's sober, and I'm going to tell him about Jesus now, but, you know. And then Dave comes up. You met Dave on Transformation Sunday. Dave was here. So I'm sitting there, and, and, and I'm now I'm about 30 minutes, 40 minutes with a guy. But I've been done, honestly, for about 39 minutes. I'm just, I'm being honest, okay? Dave comes up to this guy and wraps him up in his arms and loves him and smiles and I'm sitting there next to him going, oh, hi, Jesus. <laughs> Sorry I wasn't you before. <laughs> and I just sat there. And then Dave talks with him. And then Dave, um, Dave comes to the end and says, now Pastor Drew is going to pray for you. And I said, no, Pastor Drew is not. You are. <laughs> You're Jesus right now. <laughs> and he did. Guys, if we let Jesus touch us deeply, we let Jesus touch others deeply through us. And if our lives are all about safety in our zone, if we never see the broken and go there, if we maintain our distance, if, if we ignore Jesus, we never knew him. 
I know that's offensive to say, but I want you to feel the sting of what Jesus said. You see, you see, the truth is that, that religious consumers are going to hell. In verse 41, he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, because you never went and met me in the broken. Not only are religious consumers going to hell, religious performers are going to hell. In Matthew 7, 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name do all kinds of miraculous works, doers? And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. So we have the choice in the 21st century of being religious performers and, and, and religious consumers, or we have the choice of being Jesus in the broken. And you know, here's the simple truth. Um, if we live in the fourth uh, county, the fourth largest county that's hit by the op opioid crisis, maybe we need to start a, a rehab center. Duh. One of our church partner friends in, in the Dominican Republic, um, they have this amazing ministry to broken and homeless people whose lives are really in danger because honestly, police kill people, the tourist police. Um, their job is to make things nice for the tourists, and, and this is not secondhand or anything else. There have been several occasions where, where uh, people who are drug sniffers and other things have been taken out and dumped into the ocean, <laughs> have been beaten and shot to, because it cleans, cleans them up. Every Sunday morning, you know, like somebody here comes and opens the doors and, and gets things ready early. Well, every Sunday, more, so Sunday morning there in the Dominican Republic in, in, in Santo Domingo, they would have to come and drag away all the street people that were sleeping in the, you know, the front door of the, the building. And it occurred to them one day, hey, instead of just dragging all these people out of the way so our church people can come in, maybe we ought to be Jesus to these people. <laughs> Instead of moving them out of the way, maybe we should feed them, and they do beautifully. Guys, we got a choice. We can play church and worry about ourselves and be filled with our own issues and our own schedules and soccer this and this and that and the other, or we can let Jesus have our lives. And we can go And he can use us to love in the broken and be us in the broken. And we get to meet him in the broken. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Jesus has called every one of us to reveal something broken in the world and to meet him there. And so every one of you has the call of God in your life, in the Burbs, in Baltimore, in Glen Burnie, in Severna Park, wherever you live, there's broken everywhere. The call of God is on your life to do something about it. Don't be coming to me, well, Pastor Drew, I think the church should. Well, actually, you can come to me and say that. In fact, you come to me and say, here's the broken I've seen, and in response, I think the church should. But just know this, here's what I'm going to say to you. Congratulations, church. I think you're right. Go and do it. And I just want to say that I'm really looking forward to in the days ahead, as the worship team comes on out, I'm really looking forward. I skipped around. It's not their fault. Um, I'm really, really, really looking forward in the days ahead to see how God will use you and your inspired story to be Jesus in a broken world. And here's what's going to be most exciting about that. Your faith is going to be so exponentially grown because not only are you going to be Jesus in a broken world, you're going to get to meet him in a, in a more profound and real and authentic and intimate way than you've ever met him in a classroom. And so I am dead serious when I say that we're going to obey the voice of God. We've been given the test. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to take the test successfully. And, and the church that's ever run 
is going to be known as the church where everybody's involved in answering the broken somewhere. And any idea you have uh, can be an inspiration from God. Andy Stanley says uh, something, he, he says something very, very simple. He said, don't how your ideas to death. Just let God wow you with it and he'll take care of the how. I can do all things through Christ. So the invitation is very, very simple. Will you give your life to Jesus? I mean, really give your life. Because if you give, you go. Let's stand.